Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, good morning, good night, wherever you may be in the world. People. Hello, we're going to get started momentarily. We're just waiting for a few more people to get in, come in before we start. Thank you for joining us. Not a few more minutes, just a couple minutes, or maybe just one, huh? <laughs> I, I have a friend of mine that always says this saying, I'm sure they didn't make it up. It's called, don't, don't punish the prompt. <laughs> People who get here on time shouldn't have to pay the, you know. All right. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nefer Freeman, um, and hmm, I'm doing this. So um, hello everyone. My name is Nefer Freeman. Um, this spring, it's spring, and and that means that last month, many people in the U.S. filed their tax returns. And there are probably some people who are still struggling with that process. Most people know by now whether they're getting a refund or will be made to pay more taxes. But how many of us know where our tax dollars really go? The elephant in the rooms where tax spending is talked about is the Pentagon. Welcome to Where Your 2023 Taxes Went, a People's Briefing with my IPS colleagues of the National Priorities Project, MPP, um, Director Lindsay Kashgarian and MPP Outreach Coordinator Alia Luswergro, who will give us an illuminating explanation of where our income taxes went and explain to us about MPP's newly released tax day receipt and fact sheet and other great stuff. Lindsay uh, is the program director of the National Priorities Project, where she oversees nationalpriorities.org. Lindsay's work on the federal budget includes analysis of the federal budget process in politics, military spending, and specifically how federal budget choices for different spending priorities and taxations interact. Aliyah is the outreach coordinator for the National Priorities Project, serving as project manager for growing collaborations with immigrant rights organizations and movements against climate, largely molded by her own diaspora. Leah is a first-generation immigrant who's, who has roots in the Philippines and calls Chicago and DC her home. Um, I'm glad you both are willing to do this and, and um, share your, your uh, insights with everyone. And so I don't know who we should start with. I, let me put this here. So which one are you going first? I don't know. And I'm, and you're just going to, I'm just going to hand it over to you and, and be, be quiet. <laughs> That's me. Um, thanks so much, Netfa. And thanks for to folks for joining us and, and taking time to hear about where your taxes went, which might not be the most exciting topic you can think of, but it connects to just about everything that you can think of. Um, so we, uh, every year, National Priorities Project does a tax receipt. And um, we want people to know what their tax dollars are paying for, because of course, folks all have a stake in what your tax dollars are paying for. But it's also a really relatable, understandable way of understanding the federal budget and what our federal budget priorities are. 
Um, so, you know, we might hear things about millions or billions of or trillions of dollars going to this or that. Those are numbers that are really hard for most of us to wrap our heads around. Um, and the tax receipt is a way for us to wrap our heads around numbers that we actually deal with in our lives and in uh, a way to kind of think about what those spending priorities are and whether our taxes are doing things that we want them to do and supporting things we want them to support or whether they're supporting things um, that are destructive like militarism. And so we focus a lot on how much um, of your tax money goes to militarism in particular. But the flip side of that and where I wanna start is to remind us that our taxes should be a force for good and for government to do things that improve our lives and create real security. Um, and there are examples where our taxes are doing that. So a couple of those examples are uh, healthcare. Um, we've actually been paying more for healthcare these past few years because of things like Medicaid expansions, um, because of the American Care Act and the increasing numbers of people getting health insurance through that. We still have far from a perfect healthcare system, but we had in 2022, a record low number of uninsured people in this country. And that is entirely a result of things like the Medicaid expansion and American and Affordable Care Act um, that were funded by your tax dollars. Um, and that's one of the most significant places that the average person's tax dollars go. More than $4,000 of the average taxpayer goes toward healthcare, including Medicaid, Medicare, uh, and those programs. So this is an example of the good that can be done with our tax dollars. Uh, another example is the SNAP or food stamps program, um, which one in 10 people relied on uh, for food security. And of course that program, it doesn't do enough. The funding isn't high enough. Uh, there are many folks who should be covered who aren't, uh, but one in 10 people were able to access and use that program. That's huge. And so these are the kinds of things that our tax dollars can do and that our government can do. Uh, and those are the places where we wanna divert more of this funding. Um, so that's the context is how your, our tax dollars can do good and create real security versus the ways that our tax dollars do damage and, and actually harm security. So I wanna start by sharing um, a little bit of context about who's paying taxes, um, just, just briefly. Um, folks may be familiar with the fact, are we, are we seeing the graph? Okay, folks may yes. be familiar with the fact that, you know, the wealthy often don't pay their fair share and often pay a lower tax rate than middle income or lower income people. Um, corporations frequently, there are dozens of corporations that have gotten away with uh, paying zero taxes in, in years and when they were profitable. Um, obviously, those things are things that we need to fix. And we have uh, colleagues at the Institute for Policy Studies who focus on those issues. Uh, but one thing that that we I want to think about, because we're going to look a little bit at how our tax dollars support corporations, and in particular, how our tax dollars support military contractors. And so I just want to kind of take a look at what we're paying in taxes. So this graph shows how much of our federal revenues come from individual income taxes versus corporate income taxes. And these are the, the two biggest sources of funds for a lot of what happens at the, at the federal budget. Um, one big piece that's missing from this, you'll see if you add those up, you're not at 100%, um, just over 50%. Of the big chunk that's missing is payroll taxes that support Medicare and Social Security. Um, so we're not concerning ourselves with that today. We're just thinking about income taxes. And you can see here um, that individuals, the blue line, are paying for almost half of federal revenues through their income taxes. And corporations, the green line, are paying for less than 10%. And actually, this, this chart stops at 2021, so it's changed a little bit in the last couple of years, but the story is the same. Individuals are paying about five times as much as corporations for income taxes in this country, um, despite the fact that corporate profits have, have done quite well. And you can also see um, going all the way back, if you go back to the 40s, that it wasn't always this way. Corporations were at one point paying, tracking pretty closely with the share of 
federal revenues that was coming that were coming from individuals. So corporations are not paying as much as the rest of us, as us, as us people, um, despite despite not you know being people themselves. Um, and so I just want to kind of put that out as context for where we're going to go next. So this is uh, a few items of showing where your 2023 income taxes went. Um, and a big chunk of it, over $5,000 went to militarism. And so how do we define militarism? Um, for us, it's three things. It's the Pentagon and war and related programs. So nuclear weapons and things that are not inside the Pentagon, but are clearly uh, related to the military. It's also um, border and immigration militarization. So deportations, detentions, border patrol, um, ICE or immigration and customs enforcement, all of those things um, and the militarization of our immigration policy. And the third piece is the militarization of our law enforcement. Um, so domestic law enforcement um, at the federal level that includes things like the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Agency, um, and other federal agencies that are involved in uh, enforcing federal law and um, federal the federal prison system um, that is a small piece of the pie of mass incarceration in this country. So those are the three prongs of, of militarism um, that we're talking about here. And as you can see on the slide of that $5,000, by far the biggest chunk of that money is going to the Pentagon. And that's almost $3,000 for the average taxpayer. Um, so this is a significant amount of money for, for most folks, right? Um, but then when you look at that amount of money, more than half of it is going to Pentagon contractors. These are corporate contractors. Um, this is true of the Pentagon budget. Essentially every year, half of that money is going of the Pentagon budget is going to corporate contractors. And it's everything from Weapons contractors are, of course, the first thing that comes to mind, but, you know, IT contractors, uh, artificial intelligence contractors increasingly, um, and then more innocuous seeming things, but that are also supporting the mission and work of the Pentagon. So, you know, it includes also catering contractors to some degree, uh, but of course, the biggest chunk of it is is the weapons contractors. Um, and so we'll talk a bit, little bit more about each of these contractors um, in the next few minutes. And also about the sort of comparisons. So if the average taxpayer in 2023 um, paid, like I said, almost $3,000 for the Pentagon, uh, which is at a historically high spending level um, for the Pentagon budget. And that was true in 2023, it is even more true this year in 2024, where we have an $886 billion military budget that includes the Pentagon and nuclear weapons and, and related items, and Congress that just passed an additional $95 billion um, military aid package, um, the largest portion of which um, will also go through the, the Pentagon. So this number and this reality is is only getting worse in 2024 compared to 2023. Um, and then if you, of course you compare that to education, right? This is the classic sort of, you know, the school has to do a bake sale and the, and the Pentagon gets our tax dollars. Um, so the average taxpayer paid just $346 for public K-12 education. Um, and this is a really big issue right now for many school districts where uh, in the last few years, there had been a lot of federal COVID related aid that was flowing into public school systems and helping to support their basic operations. And that aid has now stopped and many school districts, including my own are now facing budget cuts um, and the loss of, of positions that were supported by those dollars. At the same time, of course, the Pentagon budget is continuing to grow. So where is all of this Pentagon money going? This is one of the things we want to think about because just like I talked about the historically low rate of uninsured people um, that we're getting because of policies that have been enacted, 
the number of people who've relied on food stamps because of the existence and availability of that program, the money that we're spending on the Pentagon isn't just being taken out of our pockets, it's being taken out of our pockets and put in very particular places. Um, so one of those big places is the contractors themselves, um, which we'll talk about. And another one of those places where that money is funneling um, is to the US global military presence. And I love this map because it shows where in the world the US military is. And uh, we know that there are more than 750 military installations of the US military around the world. No other country has more than 20 military installations. And this map shows you uh, where they are um, and they're everywhere. And notably they are uh, in essentially all of the places where the US has fought prior wars. Um, so Korea, Japan, Italy, Germany are some of the biggest locations for US military presence abroad. Um, and this map shows the locations of the military installations and then the size of the circle shows how big it is um, based on how many troops are stationed there. Um, so tens of thousands of troops in the biggest installations in Japan, Korea, Italy, and Germany um, at all times. And then the smaller circles show other installations, um, including things called lily pads, which may be a very small installation, like a radar installation or something like that. But as you can see, they're spread all over every continent um, and dozens of countries that have US military installations. And of course, it's very expensive to keep this going. So this is one of the biggest places um, that's driving uh, that expense in addition to the contractors themselves. Um, so I've talked about food stamps and the amount of money that, and the good that that has done, um, but the average taxpayer paid three times as much for Pentagon contractors as for the food stamps program, um, which is one of the biggest safety net programs that the United States has. Um, these contractors are um, dominated by the top five military contractors. We'll talk about a few of them. Um, the contractors also have multi-million dollar salaries for their CEOs. Um, we're going to talk about Lockheed Martin a bit. Um, the average taxpayer gave in 2023 $250 to Lockheed Martin, um, which is the number one Pentagon contractor and the number one federal contractor for all of government. Um, and in fact, has a budget, had a budget in 2023 that was higher than the budget of the State Department. So lots of money going to this contractor. Um, Lockheed Martin also uh, gets every year upward of 80 to 90% of its revenues from the federal government um, and pays its CEO a multi-million dollar salary and has put billions of dollars into stock buybacks. Um, so directly taking funds from the US military and in reinvesting them in its own stocks in order to drive up the stock prices further. Um, this is a practice that lots of corporations do, but not very many corporations are as funded by tax, no other corporation is as funded by taxpayer dollars as Lockheed Martin. And so the fact that they're engaging in stock buybacks and the high CEO salaries um, should give us more pause than even when a typical corporation does the same thing. And then here on, on this slide, we compare that to the amount paid for the child tax credit, um, which in its expanded form during the pandemic was responsible for cutting child poverty almost in half. This is one of the most successful safety net programs that we have. We know it's capable of doing tremendous good. Uh, it has been cut back this year, again, as COVID era aid has ended, um, which has plunged millions of children back into poverty who had been pulled out of poverty. And we're only paying $110 as the average taxpayer for this program, which has done tremendous amounts of good. So just a small shift of that funding from Pen the Pentagon into that program, um, we, could, we could go back to the world where we had cut child poverty in half. Um, and all it would take was an act of Congress. 
uh, one of the another one of the top five Pentagon contractors is Boeing. Um, and Boeing has also been famous lately. Boeing is also Lockheed Martin and Boeing are also um, providing weapons to Israel, which is, of course, significant right now. Um, but Boeing has also been famous lately because of all of its difficulty with commercial flights. Um, most recently, this is planes falling apart in midair. Um, there have been whistleblowers at Boeing who have talked about jumping on plane parts in order to get them to fit together as they're assembling planes, um, which is not the kind of safety record that I would hope for um, and, that, and that anyone would hope for. Um, going back a little further, of course, Boeing had problems with planes that malfunctioned and crashed. Um, so it's been an ongoing saga for years with Boeing in terms of their lack of safety in the commercial flight space. Um, but they're also one of the top five Pentagon contractors. So the average taxpayer in 2023 gave $87 to Boeing and just $23 for the Federal Aviation Administration, which is the agency responsible for regulating and making sure that commercial flights are safe in this country. So clearly this is a this is a question of prioritize not nearly enough on safety regulation and um, a virtually unlimited sum available for Pentagon contractors and Pentagon contracts. And my, my final example, um, this is actually not me even close to the top five of Pentagon contracts, but um, SpaceX has been famous for um, being owned by Elon Musk um, and all of his with all of all of the issues that brings, um, but it's also gotten really involved in the Pentagon space uh, in recent years. And so since Elon Musk's other company is Tesla, um, we just thought it would be fun to compare how much money the government is paying for contracts for SpaceX versus how much money the gov we are paying for energy efficiency and renewable energy programs across the board. This is not just Tesla. This has really nothing to do with Tesla. So we're paying as much for Pentagon and NASA contracts for SpaceX as we're paying for energy efficiency and renewable pro energy programs uh, everywhere. So um, that's disturbing. And uh, I know Aliyah is gonna talk about this a little bit more from the climate side. Um, but just to point out the the significance of of SpaceX and um, Elon Musk being someone that we can can all uh, follow in his exploits as he as he takes our tax dollars. Um, so I, I want to thank you there. Aaliyah is going to talk more about um, the climate and immigration implications of all of this, and so I'm going to hand it over to her. Awesome, thank you, Lindsay. Um, yeah, for our final trade-off, as you can see here, um, I just want to read it out loud. If you pay taxes for 2023, you likely paid $110 for ICE and CBP, um, infamously abusive agencies responsible for separating immigrant families through deportation and detention versus $14 for wildfire management as climate change contributes to more frequent and damaging wildfires across the country. So we want to dig deeper into this. Um, here we're comparing how much money goes to border militarization uh, versus how much uh, goes to climate and um, mitigating disasters such as wildfires that are so relevant now. And we make the point that there's so much going towards separating uh, immigrant communities and not enough is going to consider um, serious and genuine solutions to the climate crisis. And so to talk more about ICE and CBP, um, there are two deadly agencies housed under the Department of Homeland Security, and they're only 21 years old, but those 21 years, um, two immigrant communities have been damaging and unforgettable. And why? Well, about $25 billion um, in the budget goes to ICE and CBP every year. Um, and again, we're like the average taxpayer is paying $110 for them. And this money is used to detain 
and deport immigrants. So at any given time, there are 34,000 detention beds available, um, meaning that 34,000 people are in detention. And that's a problem because detention centers, um, they are well reported for their harsh and violent conditions. Um, immigrants face um, numerous instances, cases of medical neglect and abuse um, next to racism and harassment. Um, and then next to detentions, deportations, um, simply just tear families apart um, and often sending back immigrants to places that they have fleed um, because of conflict, war, violence, and climate disasters. So um, noting that these are the exact circumstances, why they even leave in the first place, but also um, circumstances that the U.S. has likely had a stake in creating through its own, um, you know, foreign policies. Um, so a lot of this money is going to um, violence and harm for these communities. And where else do we see money harming immigrants? So as Lindsay has mentioned, um, there was the $95 billion in foreign military aid package that passed Congress and was signed by Biden. Um, it's important to know that with this package, many months beforehand, there were absolutely terrifying anti-immigrant policies um, that some far-right legislators tried to attach onto the package. Um, and we see this important to highlight since there's a lot of fear-mongering um, and uh, absurd talk about the border being in chaos um, you know, surrounding um, immigration. And um, yeah, those are just, as I said, absurd and false. Um, so the policies that were attached onto the package, um, they word for word um, talked about closing the border um, through a quota system, talked about increasing border wall funding and also ramping up surveillance at the community levels and also the um, individual levels. Um, they also included um, horrible threats to the asylum system, uh, making it harder for people to even apply to asylum in the first place, which is a violation of both national and international law. And so in the end, again, as we know, these policies didn't make it to the final package, which um, I want to take a moment to say that's a win and that's something to celebrate. Um, however, they're not gone um, and they're still there and um, all the fear mongering is increasing and they can creep up in any supplemental package or even as standalone policies and especially re relevant to like um, state policies that we're seeing now that um, are trying to handle immigration. Um, though it's really um, belongs to the federal jurisdiction. Um, and yeah, something also to celebrate and why these bad policies didn't make it into the final package um, is the um, amazing advocacy out there with um, great coalitions and groups, um, you know, fighting for immigrant rights for a really long time. Um, so next slide, please. Um, Defund Hay is um, a coalition of um, human rights and civil rights organizations, faith-based organizations, and also directly impacted communities um, that had a stake in this, doing it policy level, um, fighting on the ground, in the field work, um, and also just doing uh, public education out there um, through writing and social media. Um, and so Defund Hay, over five years since its creation, blocked $12 billion um, in ICE and CBP, CBP spending. And um, yeah, that, that is such a win for immigrant communities because that is no easy feat, um, but uh, it was amazing to see um, that happen with all of that hard work and um, 
the coalition of diverse groups working together. And yeah, lastly, on the topic of taxes and immigration, I just wanted to remind um, everyone that immigrants pay taxes um, and immigration is good for our country. Immigrants um, you know, are also building successful businesses, um, are part of the strong workforce in the US, often taking up the jobs that people don't wanna do um, with manual labor. Um, and that's another conversation for where, where health hazards and risks like take place. Um, and yeah, immigrants are deeply integrated into American culture through food, media, arts, um, and so on. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk more about climate. Um, as immigration continues to see more investment, our in environment, our climate continues to be under um, invested. So when we look at how the US is financing the climate crisis, it is simply not enough. Um, and in our tax receipt, as Lindsay showed a few slides ago, the average taxpayer paid less than $11 for energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, and on the global scale, um, Biden has only pledged $1 billion in global climate aid, which again, if you put next to this war package of $95 billion that we keep mentioning, um, that $95 billion um, would be transformative if it were uh, invested towards um, the climate. It's enough to shift our electric grid to solar power um, with billions of dollars uh, to spare. And we also wanted to note that um, we get a lot of like mentions of the Inflation Reduction Act, which yes, can be seen as a significant investment to climate, um, but that is all coming from tax incentives and tax credits. So again, not really relating here because we are talking about um, direct federal spending. So um, the IRA does not is not from um, federal spending. And yeah, this is all to say that the real threat to our safety is the climate crisis. Um, 2023, we saw so many disasters at home and abroad in the summer from coast to coast. Um, I'm sure we saw like the wildfire smoke in the air um, affecting our breathing. Uh, we saw heat domes. Um, and floods and tornadoes, and this is only going to rise um, if we don't do anything to really cut back on fossil fuel emissions, on, on harming the planet. Um, and also the deadliest wildfire in US history um, claimed hundreds of lives in US occupied um, Maui. And then around the world, normally temperate parts of Europe roasted in heat. And in Libya, thousands of people have gone missing, have died from severe floods. Um, so the climate crisis is here. It's now. It's not something we can wait for. It's a real threat um, to our safety. And next slide, please. Um, as we continue to experience these disasters with homes being lost, um, lives being taken away from us, lifestyles and jobs having to adapt and to change. Our leaders need to really reprioritize um, taxpayer dollars back to our communities. Um, we need to invest in climate resilient futures for a livable planet. And that means for all people, especially those who are bearing the brunt of the violence from militarism and the violence from um, these climate disasters. So this includes migrants, immigrants, refugees, poor people, um, indigenous nations and peoples. Um, for all of us, we need affordable healthcare, accessible housing, education, um, a planet that we can breathe and live on and thrive on um, for now, for future generation. 
for future generations. Um, and this all requires money. This um, requires the money that um, that we're giving to the government and um, we're paying taxes. So it would be nice to see it back to our communities. Um, I will pass it on to Netva to lead us into the question and client, uh, question and answer portion of it. I just want to say thank you to everyone for um, joining us and yeah, just learning where your taxes go and um, all the bad stuff and all the good stuff where it could go to. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Aaliyah. Thank you, Lindsay. That that was great. That was a lot too. And we're going to get into it more. We have some questions here um, that will obviously the questions enhance the learning process for all of us. Um, and so we're going to go through the first one. It says, and it's anonymous. It says, um, and it's not directed at either one of you. Any a question that's not directed at either one of you, you both get a you know crack at. Even, actually, every question you both get a crack at, even if it's directed to somebody. So let's say anonymous. How much do you have to make for five thousand dollars of your tax bill to go towards the military? Um, yeah, I can take that one. So I, I'm going to assume that we're talking about the five thousand dollar figure that I mentioned, which is toward militarism overall. So that's the military, but it's also the militarization of the border or the militarization of law enforcement that we talked about. So that's the $5,000 figure as I'm talking about it. Um, so the average taxes paid total um, are is about $19,000. Um, and if there's a link to our tax receipt, so if you want to see the exact figures, um, those are available, but average total tax paid is about $19,000. So about a quarter of it is going to militarism. Um, and the income that that's based on, um, it's an average. So for anybody who, if you if you know much about averages or if you don't, the way it usually works is that, you know, there are some people with very high incomes. Um, and in the case, in this case with taxes, there are folks with very low incomes who are not paying taxes and not filing a tax return in many cases. So the average income is a lot higher than say the median or middle income. So the average income this is based on is about $105,000. So if your income is lower than that, you're probably not paying that much. Um, that said, I will say, if anyone is so motivated to pull out your own tax return um, and look for the line where it says your actual tax due, you can take that number and plug it into the calculator on our site and get your own extremely personalized tax receipt. Um, so I don't know how often folks do that, but it is an option. Um, and there's also an option where you can look up the average for pe people in your state, um, which, you know, states have wildly different average incomes. Um, and so that that's another way to kind of adjust for it to see uh, what somebody with a different income might be paying. Mm -hmm. And I pasted that in the chat. That's the right thing that I put, right? It's, it's the one full tax receipt with choice yes. of the United States. Full tax states. receipt, yeah. <clears throat> and if you, you know, don't get it there, you can do it from our website. You can get it from the website. Gus Griffin says, uh, Aaliyah, did you want to add anything to that? We can go to the next question. Okay. Um, Gus Griffin says, I'm in a lie. Oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. <laughs> that, that part wasn't, I guess, to, to read out loud. How do we respond to those who dismiss raising taxes on corporations with the response that they will just pass the cost on to the consumer slash us? Uh, I can speak a little bit to that. This is definitely a bit outside of, of my area of expertise. And we do have folks at IPS who, who really do focus on corporate taxation. Um, but the short answer is that they're not passing on all of it. That's one part of it. And there's different research about how much they're passing on. Um, but I think the more significant part of the answer that I would give um, is that taxing corporations isn't just to raise revenues. Of course, that's a part of it. But it's also to discourage a lot of the bad behaviors that we talked about of, you know, the we have we have there are folks at IPS who do research on um, corporate CEO salaries to the average worker salary. Um, so it's a way of sort of funneling some of those excess and, and the ratios in some cases are hundreds to one um, in terms of the CEO salary to the average worker salary. Um, there's also you know, this issue of stock buybacks where corporations are taking some of their profit and diverting it to buy their own stock and drive the price up. 
a lot of those bad behaviors can be curtailed somewhat by the act of taxation, by making sure that those corporations have less excess funds to engage in those bad behaviors. So there are multiple different sort of policy goals of, of raising corporate taxes. Um, and so I think, you know, even if you think that it's not worth it for the money and there are other arguments that people make about that, it's still worth it to discourage um, and, and sort of decrease their ability to engage in, in those destruct, destructive behaviors that, um, that kind of skew the system for all of us. Um, so the next question is directed to you, Lindsay, and it says, can you talk a little bit about the discretionary budget in relation to the overall budget and how our taxes are, uh, are portioned? Yeah, so um, this is this I'm, I'm taking it. This question is from somebody who follows our work fairly closely. We talk mm -hmm. a lot about the discretionary budget. Um, so there are two major portions of the federal budget. The discretionary budget is the budget that Congress passes every year and has arguments over. It covers the Pentagon and it covers the vast majority of federal programs. It covers funding for public schools. It covers funding for public health, including the CDC. It covers um, a lot of veterans programs, though not all. It covers um, it covers uh, scientific research and medical research and um, and housing programs, virtually all of them. And um, so all of these things are part of the discretionary budget, which is typically less than $2 trillion a year. And then there's a bigger section of the budget, which is mandatory spending that is driven almost entirely by Social Security and Medicare. Um, so those are the two segments, discretionary and, and mandatory. Our tax receipt is overlapping a little bit of both because what we're looking at is everything that's funded by your income tax dollars. So that actually includes some of those mandatory programs, um, specifically Medicare and Medicaid, not so much Social Security. So there's kind of a, you could kind of draw a Venn diagram of what goes where um, in terms of discretionary mandatory and what's on our tax receipt. So I hope that answers the question. And if not, you wanna have, you have a more specific question you wanna, you wanna ask about it, um, you know, feel free to, to come back in the chat and, and ask that. Yeah, yes, please do. Absolutely. But I think you, you covered it very well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Stephen Semfer, um, excellent presentation. He says excellent presentation. They say excellent presentation. Since the tax receipt is a reoccurring report, would a year to year comparison be possible or has the methodology been tweaked over time? And or any observations about trends in the flow of tax dollars over time, uh, e.g. is the tax payer investment in militarism growing or shrinking as a dollar value or share of taxes paid? Um, yeah, uh, good questions. So on the on the year to year comparison, um, I wouldn't do a straight comparison, although the uh, our methodology methodology hasn't changed significantly. So that's not the reason. Um, the biggest reason probably is just that the, the you would need to compare the share of total taxes paid. So, you know, I said $5,000 on militarism. Um, last year, it may have been more or less, partly because the military budget went up or went down, but also partly because the amount of taxes that people pay total goes up or down with all kinds of things, with tax policy, with incomes. Um, so, you know, there's um, there are those things driving it. So for example, whereas this year, I said the average total tax paid was about $19,000. Um, last year when we did this, it was much lower. It was like fourteen or $15,000. So you wouldn't want to do a straight dollar comparison because everything has, has gone up basically. Um, and But you could do kind of a comparison of like what portion of the total tax is going to the military. Um, and so that kind of connects to the, the second part of your question. Um, where one of the trends that we've seen over the last few years is that while military spending has gone up and up and up, um, it you know it is it's just on a steep trajectory. And Stephen, I know you know this, and probably most folks on the call know this. Um, what we've seen over the last few years is that it's kind of going toe to toe with the health portion of our tax receipt, which is also on a steep trajectory up for some good reasons like Medicaid expansion, and for some not so good reasons like just the 
inflationary rate of healthcare and um, and other forces that you know I'm not a healthcare economist, so I won't try to get too too deep into it. But um, but there are sort of these different factors at work, um, and so you you know the share of the tax we used to do like a tax dollar and do different shares of the tax dollar. The share of the tax dollar that's been going to healthcare has been um, actually overtook the military a couple of years ago, um, but military spending has been going up the whole time. So um, so the trends are a little bit difficult because it's kind of expressed as a share, the trends are a little bit difficult to untangle and don't necessarily show what the trends in spending look like by themselves. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, so it's the share of militarism isn't necessarily growing over time. It's actually been fairly steady, um, but that's just because there there is one other thing that is going up, which means that many of the other things like housing, like public education and things are are lo are taking up a smaller share because these two things, healthcare and militarism are gobbling everything up. That was, that was probably less uh, less organized a response than I would have hoped, but I hope it gets to the to the question. Okay. Um, I mean, I, it was a deep question, so it was hard to, you know, give. Um, then let me do this one is a short to the point question. How can we change our U.S. militaristic focus? That's a great question. We could do several <laughs> webinars on that one. Question. Yeah. Um, and it's and it, but it gets to the it gets to the heart of it, right? This is why the the only reason we need to know these things is because we want to do something about it. So it's it's a great question. Um. You know, I think, um, so, on, you know, on a note of hope, Aliyah mentioned that the militarism of the border, which was included in earlier versions of the $95 billion package that passed Congress recently, that that did not make it into the final version. And so that's a success. That's a win. Um, it may be a short term win. We know that fight is going to come back again and that we'll have to fight it again. Um, but that is in part because of the efforts of groups like the coalition that Leah mentioned, Defund Hate. Um, and so part of it, and part of the reason that we've been talking about militarism these last few years and not just the military, is that we want to make these connections between militarism in war and militarism in law enforcement, and militarism in immigration, because militarism doesn't stop at borders. Militarism crosses freely over borders and US militarism takes place in our communities and it takes place at our borders and it takes place everywhere around the world as, as we saw on that map. So the reason that's important is because we're not just drawing the connection between militarism, we are also doing the work at NPP and IPS to make connections between the movements that work on each of those things and that have not necessarily always um, not always had each other's backs to the degree that that we might wish. Um, there have certainly been lots of folks involved in all of these movements for a very long time. Um, but we want to see a more cohesive pulling together of movements that are involved with, say, militarism of law enforcement, militarism of immigration, and militarism um, in terms of war. And I will say I'm incredibly encouraged right now that we've seen beautiful examples of that recently, um, including uh, joint protests by immigration rights groups calling for a ceasefire in Gaza and for um, the cease of deportations and detentions um, and harmful immigration policies. So I think the movements is the big answer. That's how we solve this. Um, we aren't necessarily going to convince folks in Congress and folks in the White House, whoever they are, that we're right and they should do what we want unless we have those movements, mass movements, lots of people involved um, to, to make those changes. So that's that's my answer. That's how we stop militarism is through these movements um, and through trying to sew these movements together and seeing some of the ways that that's happening right now. Um, I think there, there are a lot of really strong connections and, and movements being built right now uh, at this particular moment too. Um, I'd like to add to that, and I think we can cover the next question too about helping the cause and spreading the word. Um, 
what can we do to shift the momentum? Um, I feel like also with the previous question, if we had a clear cut answer to shifting away from militarism, um, we'd be we'd be doing it already. Um, but um, it's hard for a reason. Um, a, a lot of money is going to the military, but it's not quite visible. So I'd say one of those things is really getting the word out there um, that a lot of money goes to the military and are lining the pockets of Pentagon contractors, um, even like the Pentagon just failed its um, sixth audit. And like with any other agency, this would not like fly by. Um, and also, yeah, just how many contractors are, uh, contracts are even happening between military and government um, is, is just a messy thing. So um, a lot of this is being enabled. Um, but I think with any information that we can grasp on to, and the reason why NPP like publishes this data and researches is to like reach um, um, the average like taxpayer and the person that hey like the military the military and all of its branches um, from border enforcement even to like police and like prisons um, they're impacting us. So um, there are like Lindsay mentioned, a lot of groups doing this work, um, really exposing um, what the military can do and is capable of. Um, and one campaign I'd like to highlight is folks at Veterans for Peace um, doing a whole campaign on protesting like military air shows. And some of us have grown up like watching these and saying, ooh and ah, like, oh, what a spectacle. But, you know, um, th that's a lot of emissions in the air. Um, that's propaganda for militarism. Um, so yeah, just like education is one of the basic things. I think also like really moving the money and like looking into um, policies and like divesting um, from the military um, is like another way. But yeah, this is like definitely a long haul um, fight um, because the U.S. depends so much on militarism as security and as like that first and immediate response to, oh, what can we do with this situation and in this other part of the world is to really build up that power. But um, yeah, like we are all for um, peaceful solutions and solutions that would benefit like the people. Um, and so also like really shifting the conversation to where this money could go to again like climate and housing and healthcare all these social programs that are not funded enough um so those are some of the ways that we can shift that conversation thank you thank you Lee. there's gus has a follow-up question about his other one it says in terms of and you can i think you can see these like i'm seeing them right in terms of revenue which is more problematic the rich in corporations not paying a, a fair share in quotations rate or the tax loopholes they get on the backside. Maybe I didn't read that correctly. It has a question mark. It sounds like I'm not reading it right. Like a question. Yeah, I think I think I got the idea. I'm, I'll I'll go ahead and give a quick answer. Um, but again, corporate taxation is not something that, that we that we go super deep on at National Priorities Project. Um, so, but we do have research that we've done. Um, over the past few years that the tax loop tax loops loopholes in general or tax breaks on the whole are cost about as much as the entire discretionary budget. So those aren't they're just the corporate ones. And a lot of those go to individuals and a lot of those go to middle class individuals like the home ownership um, mortgage deduction. Um, so it, it does it's not a perfect answer to the question, but it does kind of illustrate the point that tax breaks are a huge, um, a huge problem. <laughs> um, I, I don't have a straight answer for which one is a bigger problem. And I think, you know, clearly the sort of best policy would be to address both. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so there's some people are putting your questions in the chat and it's going to be hard for me to keep up with those. So I'm asking you to put them in the Q, Q and A. There's a reason we do that because it helps us kind of keep up with them. And anonymous has. Can you talk about the uh, how there is even more military spending? In fact, we probably only have 
time for maybe two more questions, unfortunately. This one is, can you talk about how there are even more military spending, including such things as unfunded mandate lists and the overseas contingency funding? Is that accounted for in the tax receipt? Uh, short answer, I'll keep it short. Yes, all of it is accounted for. Um, for folks who know what the unfunded priorities list is, um, it's something that it's additional spending that will get rolled into the spending allocations that Congress passes. So yes, that is included. There currently isn't overseas contingency funding. That was something that, um, that was a mechanism during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. That official mechanism hasn't been used in a few years, but we do have supplemental funding for Ukraine last year. And this year, the 95 billion package that just passed for Ukraine, Israel, Taiwan. Um, and yes, all of that is included. Mm -hmm. I'm going to jump to this question that's uh, from a colleague, and this is probably the last one. Uh, Olivia asks, can you tell us about local and state e efforts to engage elected uh, champions, re reinvest budget funds from the militarized economy back to the into communities' needs? Yeah, um, local and state efforts is, is a good question. Um, so I'm going to say there are sort of that could cover two bases. One is local and state efforts to exert pressure on federal politicians locally and at the state level, senators and, and members of Congress. Um, and so uh, we work with multiple groups that do that. And yeah, that includes the Poor People's Campaign. It includes um, the Defund Hate Coalition has activists all around the country. Uh, it includes um, many other organizations. Friend, Friends Committee on National Legislation is a big one, has chapters all over the country, uh, many peace action chapter, chapters all over the country. Um, so all of these have folks who are exerting pressure on their federal officials at that level. Um, but there also, um, there also are some local campaigns to pass like local or city, mostly city resolutions um, that this level of military spending is harmful to these other priorities. Um, and we've worked with groups in different cities, um, New York City itself, New Haven, Connecticut, um, a couple of other towns in Connecticut, um, and various towns that are passing kind of local resolutions, which for folks who you know remember kind of back in the day on either the nuclear issue or um, South African apartheid, there were similar kind of local resolution efforts. So, um, so that's also something that we've helped with. Sorry, I, was on, I think I was on mute. And so thank you so much, Lindsay and Aaliyah, um, for this vital work that you do. No matter how we think that we are going to uh, address this issue, the issues of overspending on these things that we don't need, um, this information and the research you do is also vital for that, no matter what angle you're coming from. This is indispensable, invaluable information. So thank you so much for, for this. And that people should need to check out the um, National Priorities Project on IPS's website, but you also have this nationalpriorities.org, right, is the website directly for the project. Thank you so much. And everybody, thank you for joining us. This, this session will also go up on the IPS YouTube channel. So if you go to the YouTube and look up Institute for Policy Studies, you'll find our YouTube channel. You'll be able to share this um, with other people or rewatch it. And we also have a lot of other great things up there on the channel. So thank you everybody for joining us.